The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So it's always good to take the precepts, um, and even better to keep the precepts. That's, the <laughs> that's where I say that the merit or the pin, the punya is made, is keeping it, not just taking it. But if we take it with a sincere mind, that's, that is some, some uh, merit we're making punya. And of course the chanting is a good way for us to come together and become present. Chanting is quite a good thing to do for, before our meditation, just so it settles the mind and uh, brings up uh, uh, a more focused mind, but also a mind that lets go to some degree of the problems of the day. Um, or the concerns for the future that we have. So, so this morning, I'll just introduce myself and say hello to those who are watching on, online. And this is being live, we say live streamed, live streamed. It's a funny word, isn't it? And uh, so it's very nice to include those people, you know, in today's talk, because these days we live with an aging population. I'm part of it. <laughs> I'm getting old. So. And many people, due to old age, to age, to sickness, to ill health, they can't come. So it's very nice that the temple, the meditation centre, can come to them in that case. And we're very lucky from that point of view. So today, and I'm just going to mention my name is uh, uh, Ajahn Nisarano. Most of you know me, but for those who don't, I'm thinking, who is this person sitting up the front there? And uh, I have been a monk, uh, um, a fully ordained monk for 22 years and was ordained by Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahmavanksa, and have been living in Sri Lanka for 13 and a half years. So quite a long time, actually. And as I mentioned this morning, in Sri Lanka, some people ask me, do you like Sri Lanka? After I've told them I've lived there 13 and a half years, do you like Sri Lanka? <laughs> wow. So I thought I'd begin with a quotation, as I often do. It's usually in Pali, but this one was actually meant to be last week. I don't know if you were here last week, but I spoke about right view and how this is really the Buddha's biggest gift to us because it's right view is the result of his enlightenment. It's what he saw, the reality he saw. And it's, it's a reality that maybe, maybe it's not our reality. We don't really understand how the world is, but right view gives us a handle on reality, the way things really are. And so this is the Buddha's gift to us. And it's an extraordinary gift, really, because otherwise we are very much in the dark. And we appreciate that these days when we see so many people. If you see, check out the internet, I mean, some of the ideas that are going around on the internet are just amazing. They really reflect that being lost in the dark. So the arising of somebody like a Buddha uh, he often referred to himself as the Tathagata, is something extraordinary. And this is part of Buddha Nasati, because when we, um, when we appreciate uh, th what the Buddha has given us, a Buddha, it's good to remember that the Buddha, the last one, is only one of, seri of a series. It's nothing, uh, in a sense, personal. Uh, but when we do reflect and appreciate what gift uh, the Buddha has given us, a way to see the world, make sense of the world, then that's part of our Buddha Nasati because we get gives rise to a very positive feeling, maybe inspiration, and that can be used in our meditation, certainly in our lives, to lift us. And uh, the thing that comes to my mind is, you know, when uh, part of Buddha Nasati, Ah, I'm so lucky to have been able to encounter the Buddha's teaching, you know, and it is so useful for me. So this is a part of Buddha Nasati, that appreciation. And so the Buddha said this uh, about himself. He talked about the fact that when the sun and the moon don't exist, the universe, well, this, this, uh, this part of the universe is plunged into total darkness. And uh, then he likened that to the rising of a Buddha or a Tathagata. And he says, so too, there's a bit before this, monks, so long as a Tathagata, this is a Buddha or a, one of the series of Buddhas, has not arisen in the world, an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one, 
for just so long there is no manifestation of great light and radiance. But then blinding darkness prevails, a dense mass of darkness. For just so long there is no explaining, teaching, proclaiming, establishing, disclosing, analyzing, or elucidating of the Four Noble Truths. This is what Buddha teaches. <laughs> Sounds simple, doesn't it? <laughs> and then he continues, but monks, when a Tathagata, a Buddha, arises in the world, an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one, then there is the manifestation of great light and radiance. Then no blinding darkness prevails, no dense mass of darkness. Then there is the explaining, teaching, proclaiming, establishing, disclosing, analyzing and elucidating of the Four Noble Truths. What for? The Noble Truth of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Origin of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Cessation of Suffering, and the Noble Truth of the Way Leading to the sensation, Cessation of Suffering. So that's lovely, isn't it? Just think of that great light. And the, the darkness for me is just that not knowing, really. And, and you see that with people in the world. We can see it in our lives, we can see it in other people's lives that sense of not really knowing what life is for, what's the purpose. And so some of the uh, things people do and say seem so they will not lead to their happiness. It's coming from that ignorance, from not understanding what life is about. So this is, and then actually the Buddha concludes by saying, therefore monks, an exertion should be made to understand this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It's very interesting with the Four Noble Truths that the Buddha always is pointing out this is suffering. He's not pointing out this is my suffering. <laughs> He's pointing out as an experience that arises for us. Because when we experience things in that way, not taking them personally, we can understand the universal quality of it and it takes the sting out of our individual difficulties in life. So, and this was another verse that I liked that uh, comes, it's very nice, comes with it actually, it's, it goes well with it. And it says from the Dhammapada, walking upon this path, you will make an end of suffering. Having discovered how to pull out the thorn of lust, this is like greed, I make known the path. So he's showing us the way to happiness showing us the way to remove the difficulties in our lives, you know, remove the source of the problems in our lives, which is wanting. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? It's tanha, we say, in partly wanting, craving, desire, all these things. So that's not what I'm talking about today anyway, but I was going to mention, um, this is by way of an introduction, that in 2021, that's what we say these days, 2021, we don't say 2021, 2021, Sri Lanka will be hosting the 12th Global Conference on Buddhism. And this is uh, something that uh, Ajahn Brahm is one of the spiritual advisors for, so he, uh, he promotes it. And it's the 12th one. The last one was in uh, San Francisco and uh, the one before that in Canada and this time in Sri Lanka. And it may be the first time it's actually been in a Buddhist country. It's quite interesting, isn't it? And I asked one of the people who was involved with it, who knew about it, you know, what, what's the theme for this conference? Because they, they all have different themes, you know. And he said to me, it's Buddhism and mindfulness as a tool for developing artificial intelligence. I said, wow, that's very specialised, isn't it? <laughs> I thought, is it possible, really? <laughs> Because do you know what artificial intelligence is? It's using computers. There's a definition I got down here, actually. Using, uh, what does it say here? The branch of computer science dealing with the reproduction or mimicking of human levels of intelligence, self-awareness, knowledge, conscience. Conscience, that's interesting. Uh, thought in computer programs. So I thought, wow, that's pretty unusual. <laughs> I, I thought, what, actually, I also thought, how many people will attend this? <laughs> It's going to be a small group, actually, though IT is pretty big these days. Then, of course, I heard later that the theme was actually Buddhism and mindfulness as tools for developing emotional intelligence. I thought, oh, right. <laughs> now I get it. I thought, that's right. So it was really, it was quite funny, that, that slip of the tongue, but it made it quite interesting, actually, I thought. 
So this is where the talk will focus actually is on emotional intelligence and Buddhism. Um, I'll probably be giving a talk at this conference actually on the same thing, so it's sort of a beginning, you know, preparation for it. So one of the important things to realize, last week as I said I spoke about right view and that's like a map of uh, the territory we need to travel in terms of insight to develop wisdom. As I said last week, you know, right view and the, particularly the Four Noble Truths, that was the Buddha's wisdom. We have to make it our own wisdom by investigating it, looking into it, uh, from uh, our own wisdom and from our own experience too. So it's what we need to travel, the path we need to travel. And very much uh, a, a big part of the wisdom aspect of, of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. Do, do people know the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path? Sama Sankapa, right intention. Ajahn Brahm's calling it right motivation now. And they work together because we have the map with uh, right view, we have the map of insight, and it points out that uh, dana or giving is important, that our parents are a special uh, karmic relationship, uh, that there is karma, results of our actions, of body, speech and mind, which will bear results of the same quality as our intention when we did those things. And the last, uh, and that there is rebirth, there are other states of existence that we can be reborn into. And lastly, that there are those that have seen from direct experience the reality of the world, the nature of the world, and they can teach that to us. And of course the Buddha is one example of that, well, of a teacher like that. So these two work together and the, as I say, we have the map, but the right intention, uh, sometimes called right motivation, other ones. I like right attitude too, is good. Is how we travel, how we travel on that journey of insight. Because this is very, very important um, for, for whether we will arrive at the goal or not, actually, which is enlightenment. Because the means we use have to be wholesome, have to be positive. So this is why the Buddha uh, emphasized this, you know, this aspect, right intention. But uh, I was going to, and it's, it is the essence, the essence of right intention is, um, first of all, uh, renunciation. This is called nekama in Pali, and this is uh, giving up uh, our sensual desires, reducing our sensual desires and looking within. And the second one, is uh, avirapada, and this is non ill will or non aversion, so this negativity. And the last one the Buddha mentions is non harming, this is abhihingsa, abhihingsa. So these aspects tie into, you know, things like loving kindness, compassion, giving, all these sorts of positive emotions. And this is how we're intended, we're, the Buddha intended us to travel this path. And you know, we have that saying, don't we, that the, the means have to match the goal that we're supporting, that we're aiming at. The means, uh, 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 the goal doesn't justify using any means that, we, uh, that come to hand. And one of the important things that I thought about uh, with Buddhism and emotional in intelligence is that all the aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path, they're really there to encourage this emotional intelligence, this positive and wholesome states. Not only this right intention, which I'll speak more about, and that these wholesome intentions, these wholesome emotions that we develop, these are the cause for happiness. And very recently, you know, uh, it's very interesting because we have often, I was talking to somebody the other day, and we have this notion that, you know, I want to be happy, you know, so like, like we can actually force ourselves to be happy. And you know, I want to be happy. And I thought, well, you, it's not quite like that, is it really? Just wanting to be happy is not enough. We really need to create the causes for that happiness to come up. It's not as if happiness is something we can turn on or turn off. If it were, that would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> so I liken that, it occurred to me, that's a bit like somebody who wants to be in Sydney 
but they're not doing anything about getting to Sydney. They haven't gone to the train station, they've not gone on a bus, they haven't gone to the airport. They haven't done anything that will be a cause for a rising in Sydney. And that's the same with happiness, wanting happiness without creating the causes for it, it won't happen. It will lead to a frustration, won't it? You know, people ask themselves, why aren't I happy? You know, you know, I should be able to make myself happy, you know, coming from this very strong sense of self and will. And that, of course, won't work. <laughs> Many people have tried that. And uh, today I was talking too to some people about happiness and success, because this is often, people often um, have the idea they want to succeed in life. Most people do. Nobody here that doesn't want to succeed. <laughs> I don't think there will be very many people who don't want to succeed. Everyone wants to succeed. But I'd ask, you know, ask, you can ask yourselves, because that's what a Dhamma talk is about, really asking ourselves. Does success make us happy? Does success necessarily make us happy? It may or it may not, of course. It may or it may not. But if we have, this is the, what I would like to emphasize, if we have happiness, it's a very good condition for success. But success by itself is not necessarily going to give rise to happiness. And that depends particularly on how we, how we have attained our success, isn't it? If we have attained it by um, uh, harming others, harming ourselves, you know, um, using unethical means, then it's very unlikely we can feel happy and satisfied about it. But if we've done it in a good sense, you know, if it's succeeded um, by hard work, by good intentions, then we can feel a sense of satisfaction that we have done it well. And that may lead to happiness. So I think it's important to, for us to get the order of things right, that happiness is the thing we need to work on developing. <laughs> and from that, success will come. And it's very, very much more likely that a happy person will be a successful person. And if they don't succeed, they're still happy. <laughs> They've still got that happiness. So it's a win-win situation. And because of that, uh, uh, because of that uh, comments this morning, I remind me of a story by Ajahn Brahm that perfectly illustrates that. Do you remember the, the Mexican fisherman story? Mexican? It's in the op opening, the, uh, op opening the door of your heart, that's it. Do you remember that story? No. In this story, and I think it, it may be a real story, actually, I, I don't know the background. There's an American professor from a prominent business school, I think Harvard, <laughs> who goes to Mexico on holiday and he goes to one of these out of the way fishing villages, a small village, you know, probably has got a resort as well. And he meets a, a fisherman there. And this fisherman, he goes out every day, every morning and goes fishing and catches some fish, comes back and he sells it and he has fish for the family. And, and in the afternoon he can take a siesta, a rest, and, you know, be with his family, and then in the evening he, he goes down to the cantina, 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 I think you say, um, which is like the bar, I suppose, uh, to to meet up with his friends and have uh, coffee, maybe they have coffee, but <laughs> probably, probably other things. And, uh, and the pre professor <coughs> says to him, well, you know, you could do much, much more, you know, you could really do much more. And he, he said, I'll outline a business plan for you, a plan for success. And he says, first of all, you want to do, instead of just fishing in the morning for enough fish to feed your family and make a living, he said, go out longer, catch more fish, and then you can buy more boats. And he said, you keep doing this, and then you can get more boats, you can employ more p fishermen to do the fishing, and you get a fleet, you get a whole fleet. And then he said, and then you create, the, then you move your head office to Mexico City or to Los Angeles. <laughs> and you've got your your uh, mega corporation on the way. And then you float it as a public company and you make millions, you make millions. And then the fisherman says, uh, what's that for? And he says, well, then you can come to Mexico again and live in a small seaside uh, village and then you can go out fishing whenever you feel like it and you don't have to worry about a living and then you can come back and you can have a rest, a siesta and then, he, and then after that be with the family and go out with your mates in the evening. And the fisherman, of course, said, 
already have that. <laughs> so he's already had his happiness. So why does he need to go for this sort of success? That is success for sure. And that's the path that uh, many people will travel. It's the idea that once you're successful, it will bring happiness. But that's not necessarily the case. It depends on how you've attained that success and really whether that's... Uh, um, that your, your values are in the right place for developing happiness. So that's a nice story, isn't it? I like that story. <laughs> but it really fitted this morning. I thought, oh, that really fits with this. And you know, I mentioned the way we travel the, the Noble Eightfold Path is very, very important. It's, it's, it is actually part of the goal because if we travel the path uh, the Buddha's teaching, travel the path of the Buddha, with these positive, wholesome values. This is what we arrive at, the letting go of all the negative values, completely, uh, we say, eliminating, eradicating all those negative aspects of the mind, greed, hatred and delusion. And I like, I remember, this is really dating myself, I remember saying a saying from uh, Marshall McLuhan. Do people remember Marshall McLuhan? I'd be interested to see, anybody here remember him? Yes, there we are. You're dating yourself. I'm dating myself too. He was one of these people who was on about new technology and everything. It was new then. In the Was that the 70s? Yeah, yeah 70s, 1970s. And he came out with a book. I think it's called Medium. The Medium is the mas Message. Not the Massage. The Medium is the Message. That mass communication itself it contains the message that it's conveying for our lives. And it's the same for the... The way we practice Dhamma is part of the message too. It is the message. If we want to achieve something that is totally wholesome, totally positive, without the negative aspects of the mind, we have to go towards developing those qualities, reducing the negative aspects in our mind. So the, the uh, Sama Sankapa, the right intention, is part of that. It's the medium is the message. So. Maybe I'll just talk a little bit about what it is and how we develop it. I think how we develop it is much more important, actually. And, and the Buddha gave some very good points on how to develop it. Uh -huh. So we have, yes, there's a quote here from Vidajan Brahm's translation that right intention is actions of body speech and mind coming from a motive of renunciation coming from a motive of kindness coming from a motive of gentleness this is called right motivation so that's very good and it's very interesting that where do these uh, um, uh, right intentions or such and brahms calling calling them motivations come from and the buddha uh, he tells us that they arise from perceptions of renunciation, kindness and gentleness. And I'll go to his teaching on this, which is one of the suttas from the Majjhimanikai, the middle length discourses, where he talks about his own experience before he was enlightened. Quite interesting. He developed this before he was enlightened. So because they are perceptions, we can develop them. We can uh, repeat them more and more. We can start to look in that way. We can start to look instead of what we're getting from life, getting from others, instead to look at what we can give to life, what we can give to others. Instead of looking uh, with uh, that others are a threat, uh, uh, having anger towards them, we can look with loving kindness towards others. Instead of harming others, you know, wanting to get back at them through words, actions, we can develop the sense of helping them, wishing to uh, having compassion in the mind. So this is, these are the sort of perceptions we're working to encourage. We have plenty of negative perceptions, so if we can develop these positive perceptions. And it's only a matter of repetition. This is actually the Buddha's basic message, actually. And then, if we develop these perceptions more and more, that's where we'll come from. That's where we'll, we'll come from a sense of giving, we'll come from a sense of kindness, we'll come from a sense of helping, not wanting to harm others. And that will become the, 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 our normal, uh, normal way of operating. So this is 
something that our perceptions can help us do. So the important thing is how do we, uh, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about what they are first of all, just because that makes the right intentions as I mentioned are renunciation. This is a, in English, it's not a word that I think many people um, relate to. I, I find it a difficult word actually. It's in Pali, it's nekama. And it's, it's a sense of giving or giving up, letting go. And it's particularly aimed at uh, sensory desire, you know, our desires for things that we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. Because when we really, we, we realize that the, the Buddha is telling us that the cause for our difficulties in life is really this sensual desire. This is a big part of, of desire. It's not only sensory desire. Our desire for things to make us happy from outside ourselves. Things like sights, like, uh, you know, for instance, more practically speaking, you know, football, cricket, sports, arts, uh, music, uh, nice conversations. Food is a big one, isn't it? The other day we had a, a magazine from Coles. It's just food, all of it. Of course, what does Coles sell? <laughs> but you think they'd have some other articles, actually, I thought, but it was all to these pictures of food. I thought, great for torturing monks. <laughs> you can look at, after 12, you can look at this magazine and you're not eating it. <laughs> I thought, great. <laughs> so what the Buddha is, is inclining, what he's trying to do is incline us away from our dependence, looking for our happiness in those sense contacts, in seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching and looking for the happiness inside instead of getting what happens usually too with uh, those sense contacts. We become, as it were, addicted to them. We want more, if we, if we find one enjoyable, we like it, we want to repeat it again and again. So that's the essence of these sense contacts. They take us towards addiction, whether it be cigarettes, whether it be alcohol, whether it be sugar, whether it be tea, coffee, whether it be heroin or whatever. It's so all essentially there's that aspect of addiction that comes up when we like something. And uh, in the end, it doesn't necessarily satisfy us as much as, well, it can't really satisfy us within. What we want is happiness within, not happiness coming from without. And so giving, of course, is one of the big aspects that works against this sense of, uh, of getting, wanting, uh, which nekama, this renunciation, is addressing. So when we give, that's sort of like uh, thinking of others, not thinking of ourselves. It's reducing that sense of what I want, what I need, what I like, what I don't like. And giving really makes for happiness, actually. It's a, it's a great form to develop happiness. I call it the best antidepressant, <laughs> if we can give something. And we have the very, um, you know, a noble form of giving. People really uh, are impressed by it. I am impressed by it. It's when somebody gives their life for another, you know, whether it be for their children or for other, another person, you know. And you see that sometimes. People just jump in and rest, try to rescue a person and they may drown in the process or may die in the process. It's extraordinary. They're almost like they don't think about it. So that's a noble, very noble form of giving. But what's the highest giving? Dhamma, it is, yeah. Because that makes the difference in how people experience the world and whether they experience it uh, uh, looking at the world from a wise or a kind, or a positive, uh, wholesome uh, perspective or not. So that's the, um, the aspect of renunciation. There's a lot more to it, of course. One can go on a long, long time. Um, and one of the, uh, that's a nice thing, yes. One of the things that it makes uh, this sense of uh, renunciation, giving up, giving to, to life, giving to others, is the sense of self, isn't it? It's the sense of self, which makes it, you know, I've got to look after number one. I've got to get, I like this, I don't like this. I want this, I want that. And there's a nice story from Nasruddin that brings out the importance of this. It's actually 
throughout the whole of the teachings of Buddha, actually. When Nasruddin uh, was at home, he's a, a Sufi holy man. <laughs> he's a bit of a funny holy man. I call him a scallywag. And it's, it's a, sort of a tradition that's grown up, too. There's supposed to have been a real person, Nasruddin, but I think more things have grown up in the meantime. And one evening, Nasruddin was at home, but he was upstairs, and his wife was downstairs. And his wife was downstairs, and she heard this almighty thud. And she yelled out to Nasruddin, what's happened? Are you okay? And Nasruddin said, oh, yes, I'm fine. It's just my cloak dropped on the floor. She said, how come that was such a loud thud? And she, he says, I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's very true for, for us too. You know, when we're in it, whatever the situation be, it will be a loud thud. It can turn into a, a really difficult situation. There's another good story with Nasruddin when he was a similar, similar idea, where he was sort of trying to outdo another so-called holy, holy person. He said, I... I'm so selfless, I never think of myself at all. I only think of other people. I only think of other people, not myself. And that's where he said, yes, I'm so uh, selfless. I, th I, don't, uh, I don't think of myself at all. I think of myself as being like other people. And then he added, therefore I can think about myself. <laughs> because he was thinking of, them, of himself as like somebody else. So he's very, very tricky, and you can see, you know how the mind works, can't you, to, to outdo each other, to compete, but also that sense of self is really behind that, you know, trying to score against this other holy person who said they never think of themselves, they're so selfless, they never think of themselves, only other people. And that's Rudin, I think of myself as other people. <laughs> it's not true, obviously. <laughs> And of course, the second one I mentioned before is non-ill will, and this uh, avia pada. And um, of course, you know, I think uh, one of the things with the Buddha's teaching is always to investigate. You know, when we are angry, when we express our anger through actions or speech, or even mentally, just to check up how we feel, because I think this is a, a great way to wisdom. And my, uh, my, the thing I always ask myself is, what am I getting out of this? <laughs> and that's very useful, you know, just to really look, you know, what one's really getting out of, say, for instance, anger in this case. And you see, you know, you just become very hot and bothered. It's a very unpleasant experience. And this encourages us to look for a way out of this anger and look to uh, a means of dealing with it in a, a more positive way. Because we realise we're not getting much. What is the thing that people get out of being angry? Do you, this is what I often emphasise. It's a really good... Hmm? Excitement. Yeah, there's energy. That's very good. Thanks, Cora. Yeah, that's true. There is excitement. There's power. There's energy. That's actually the biggie, actually. That's a big one. But usually it's motivated or coming from a sense of, I'm right. <laughs> I'm right. So I always say to people, whenever we, and I say it to myself, when you feel like you're right, beware. <laughs> beware what you say and you do. But of course, the, uh, the Buddha expressed um, the antidote to this anger is avyapada, and that means non ill will, non aversion. So it covers many positive emotions like a metta, loving kindness, maitri, and sinala in Sanskrit. Um, it covers uh, patience, being patient, kanti, it, it covers compassion, it brings up any of the positive emotions, contentment, thankfulness, respect, um, confidence or faith, these are all very positive emotions. So these are all part of um, non-aversion. But of course, you know, metta is the best, is the most direct uh, uh, thing that counteracts um, anger and aversion. How does that work? And I think people here, people here tried sending meta to the person you're, who's just abused you or, or done something that you're really angry about. Has anybody tried that? How was it? Hmm? Imp impossible, I think I heard. Yeah, it is. It is impossible, actually, unless you're an arahant or or the second, uh, second last stage of enlightenment, anagami. 
because then there's no ill will in the mind to react. But the first person who needs metta, who's that? Us. <laughs> we need it. And if we manage to give ourselves metta, to soothe, calm ourselves, then we have metta for the situation. Probably not for the person, actually, to be honest. That's, that's usually later. We may be able to be kind about them. Um, and usually it's actually not metta that's very good when someone upsets us, but compassion. Because we realize at, at deeply this person cannot be happy you know, doing and saying the things they, they've just done or said. Um, but that's something that will often come later. So metta is, is what we can develop uh, when we're angry, when we're upset like that. But for ourselves first. That's the, that's the, the uh, just like, you know, we have that, you just chanted the metta sutta, just like uh, a mother has love for her child, her only child. You know, we just soothe ourselves like that. And calm down, you know, it's okay, you know. <laughs> You know, and really look after ourselves and have that uh, kindness towards ourselves. And the last one is uh, intentions or motivations of non-harming. This is very important because the whole of the Buddha's path is actually um, rests on one thing. Any, any ideas? Harmlessness, that's very right, non-harming ahimsika in uh, Pali. And that's the essence. We're not going to harm ourselves, this is important, <laughs> or others. And if, if we're looking for happiness, we're looking to develop enlightenment, this is the way, we're the only way we can go, not harming ourselves or others. And of course, the opposite of harming is being helpful, being generous, being kind. Um, all these things that uh, we can do because we realize that Ourselves and all other beings don't want to experience suffering, difficulties, problems in their lives. And so we can have that quality of harmlessness. We won't harm them. And it's very interesting in the, the poems by the enlightened monks and nuns at the time of the Buddha, they're called the Theragata and the Terigata. Some of them, one of the things that they mention, you see it over and over again, it's quite interesting. They'll say, you know, since I became a monk, you know, 40, 50 years, whatever it is, a long time. He said, I've not harmed any living being in, in action or in thought. I haven't harmed any living being in action or thought. And you think, wow, you know, it, it doesn't sound like something huge, does it? But this is a very important aspect of becoming enlightened. If we don't have that attitude, it's not possible <laughs> because we've still got that... that, that uh, root that negative quality that wants to harm pe uh, others, maybe even harm ourselves. So there are the three aspects that uh, I mentioned I mentioned before, and now in some detail, but not, not as much as uh, I was going to. But now just to how do we develop right intention is very, very much the way the Buddha. It's not a mystery, actually. The Buddha's teachings, in a sense, they can be very simple, but very, very profound. And so the way we develop right intention, the Buddha mentions in a sutta called the two kinds of thoughts, called the Dweda Vitaka Sutta in the Majjhima And as, as I mentioned before, it's very interesting that he came, on, he came upon this, or he arrived at this understanding when he was unenlightened as a bodhisattva. So it makes you realize that the, the, the Buddha to be was like a work in progress. He was developing the uh, qualities, the understanding, the wisdom along the way, just as we are too. And that it wasn't just at the enlightenment experience that he, you know, suddenly he understood everything and it all came to him. So it was something that was unfolding in his understanding, in his experience. And he divided... Uh, the, uh, his thinking into two types and those that uh, were motivated by unwholesome or um, negative states of mind and those that are motivated by positive or wholesome states of mind. And the essence of what he discovered was that, and it, it's no surprise, but we don't, we don't act on it, we don't actually use it in our lives. The way we incline the mind, what we focus on, what we choose to cultivate 
by d repeating it again and again. This becomes the way we look at life. This is becomes becomes the where we are coming from. We often say that, don't we? Where are you coming from? This is so. In other words, it's by conditioning. I say reconditioning our minds, replacing our negative a conditioning, negative habits that maybe you know um, uh, we are very very taken up with sensual desire, very taken up with anger, very taken up with harming ourselves or others, and replacing them with this new intention, this new attitude. And in a sense, I quite like it too, uh, is new value. It's a value really, because we see the value in it. And then uh, I'll just quote from the Buddha, because it's quite nice actually, these, it gives you an idea and then I'll mention how he dealt with these things. He says, Monks, whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind, the focus. And that will become the experience too. <laughs> if he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of sensual desire, he has abandoned the thought of renunciation uh, to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. And then his mind inclines to thoughts or intentions of sensual desire. And then he goes on, if he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts or intentions of ill will, then his, that will become what his mind inclines towards. And if he uh, frequently thinks and ponders upon uh, thoughts of cruelty or harming, he has abandoned the thought of non-cruelty or non-harming to cultivate the thought of cruelty and then his mind inclines to thoughts of cruelty. It's all almost scientific, isn't it? Because he's not really, he's not really saying one's better than the other. He's just saying, you know, just see the results of what we're cultivating. <laughs> you know, what are we developing in the mind? He's just showing us that this leads to that. You know, if we develop uh, lots of greedy thoughts or thoughts about, um, you know, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches that we like. It will lead to this result that we'll think more about it, we'll focus more about it. And we see that in life. So uh, people obsessed with cricket, with, with football, anything. We can get obsessed with anything, actually, addicted. Um, and so the same with, uh, you know, this aversion or ill will. We can cultivate that and see the results of that. And we, in doing that, we're abandoning the more positive qualities uh, that... The other positive qualities, as I mentioned, is this uh, renunciation, this giving up, um, letting go of delighting in or fi trying to find a happiness in sense, sense experience, that desire, and looking for happiness in what I call the right place, inside us. <laughs> we all know that. I think most people know that, but they don't know how we get there. How do we get to this... Uh, happiness that's inside us. And we all know that there's nothing, that the happiness doesn't come from the cricket, from the football, or whatever. We are giving the happiness to us. We are giving the interest to it. There are lots of people who don't like cricket, don't like football, they prefer tennis, or they prefer ballet, or whatever it is. So it's really not that thing that's giving the happiness. We are. And so we really, the, when we focus on you know, uh, letting go of our reliance, our addiction to sense desire, sense pleasures. We're looking for the happiness which is within us, always has been, always will be there if we can cultivate it, allow it to come up, create the causes for it to come up. And the way the, I've got to finish soon, the Buddha dealt with these two different types of uh, thought, the, the wholesome, the positive, and the unwholesome, the negative, was that he used these three methods. He, first of all, he knew that it had arisen. So he knew that, you know, for instance, there was anger in the mind. We can use that as a, an example. And then just being aware, because oftentimes we're not actually aware of what emotions <laughs> come up. But just being aware, he said, it could cease, it could go down, it would reduce and disappear. But he said sometimes that wasn't the case. So then, he would think, does this lead to my harm or to the harm uh, for myself or for others? 
And when he contemplated that, the mind could let go of that, say, anger or that uh, sensual desire or that sense of harming. Very interesting, isn't it? The Bodhisattva had those, <laughs> had, I'm sure at very refined level, uh, those sort of negative qualities. And he said, then if that didn't work, then he would reflect, he would think, ah, this state of mind, if it's a, a sensual desire, ill will or aversion, anger uh, or harming, he said, this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbāna. So this, and then, he said, he could let go of these negative thoughts. So this is really, you know, it boils down to what I was saying too for myself, which is that what am I getting out of this? <laughs> is it giving me, you know, happiness, satisfaction, things that I'm looking for in life? And he said, he also, this is part of that reflection, so too I saw in unwholesome states danger, degra degradation and defilement and in wholesome states the blessing of renunciation, the ac aspect of cleansing. And he also saw that you, when you develop the positive, when you develop the wholesome, this leads to happiness. There is no problems with it, with developing uh, this sense of giving or giving up uh, our... Uh, <coughs> our fascination with sensual sense desires, giving up anger, giving up cruelty or harming. When we give them up, there is no harm in it. But, he said, from his perspective, that it gives rise to excessive uh, thought or intentions in the mind. It just keeps going and going. And this disturbs the body and the mind. And when the mind is in that state, it cannot be quietened internally to bring it to stillness, to samadhi. Uh, to oneness and uh, from that then he, he went on to explain how he went into the jhanas and then achieved enlightenment so this is his advice you know really that what we repeat again and again is what we're developing so many people don't realize that that's the sad thing you know we see it unless you have a, a teaching like the Buddha's teaching we don't think like this you know we just you know, we often do what other people are doing or what, uh, what we hear about on the internet, media and so on. It all seems a good thing and other people are doing it. But we don't have that perspective of that we're actually developing something by taking it on board. And we have to work out, is it a positive thing in my life, a wholesome thing or not, you know? And often I mention here, you know, particularly the, um, you know, the impact of all the news we have from the, from the media, from the internet, and the various reactions we can have to it. And, uh, you know, I know, I, th I hear people tell me, you know, how they get so angry and upset with what they read, what they see on YouTube, <laughs> and all this sort of thing, they really get hot and bothered. And, you know, I just ask them, what are you getting out of it, you know? Because in the end, we can decide what we give importance to. And the Buddha's, one of the big things the Buddha's emphasizing is wise attention, uh, not unwise attention. Wise attention is yoni so manasikara, and unwise attention is ayoni so manasikara. Wise attention gives rise to positive, wholesome states. So, and unwise attention gives rise to negative states that hurt and harm us. And if we can see that, the way that we can see that, ah, oh, when I focus on this, it gives rise to a positive in my life. Ah, that's good. That's, that, that, and that, that is conducive for my happiness. When I focus on that, it doesn't give, it gives rise to a negative aspect in my life. It gives rise to anger, aversion, a lot of greed or whatever it is. And then we can decide. And, that, and, and the important thing is to realize that's not actually making me happy. It's not actually making me happy. This is where we've got to connect the dots, really to see that the positive, the wholesome, actually leads to our happiness and the unwholesome, the negative, doesn't lead to our happiness and well-being or to others, actually. And once we connect the dots, then it becomes easier and then we can take responsibility for what we take on board, what we focus on. You know, as I say, if, if we watch the news and we get hot and bothered and 
and outraged and upset, then maybe it's best not to focus on that, you know. It's not a positive in our lives. And, uh, and certainly one cannot contribute something positive from it. You know, it will just be anger, heat, and uh, also a divisive quality. You know, you disagree with other people who, who have it, another view of it. So I'd like to finish here by saying, uh, uh, mentioning again that the Buddha's path is all about emotional intelligence. And it's very simple, really, how we can develop that by focusing on positive perceptions, positive uh, mental states, uh, as I mentioned, like giving, like I mentioned, like metta, uh, or compassion, helping, all these positive mental states that I've mentioned in the talk, and developing them, making more of them, so that there's not so much room in our mind for the negative. And little by little, our mind becomes more and more of that nature. It becomes natural. Oftentimes in the West we have the idea you either have a quality or you don't. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you know, I don't have much loving kindness. You may hear men say that actually. They, they can't get in touch with it quite often. But this is not the Buddha's, uh, the Buddha's approach because he was saying we can develop whatever we want, positively or negatively. It's up to us. So I'd like to leave the talk there. Um, and encourage all of us, myself included, to develop that which leads to our happiness, well-being and to the happiness and well-being of others because that will really be a contribution to the world. There we are. Yeah, thank you. So now it's, I think, time for some questions, if there's any questions. I don't know if there is from the internet. So I hope you'll end up developing emotional intelligence, not artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, we've got the microphone. Don't be afraid. I don't bite. No, that's good. Perfectly understood. Or, you know, very peaceful. That's what I always say with meditation, you know, if, uh, yeah, that's good. Is it working? Yeah. Is it on? Is it difficult? Today's talk. Thank you, Ajahn, yes. for the wonderful talk. Oh, all right. Um, Thank you. I just want to know, you mentioned about metta and mm. compassion. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate or just explain the difference between the two, mm. please? Yes, yes. Well, metta is, 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 of course, that sense of friendliness, you know. Metta is related to the Pali word mitta, friend, or mitra in, in Sanskrit. So it's that friendliness towards people, that sort of openness, well-wishing for people. Um, whereas compassion is actually coming from the wish that they may be free from the difficulty of suffering that they are experiencing. And that can be ourselves and others as well. So they come from, they're very similar, uh, you know, I find all these emotional, positive emotional states tend to meet you know, they're very similar, but they've got slightly different flavor, that's all. And the direction is really the main thing here, uh, that compassion is towards those, ourselves, and those who are in a position where they're suffering, there's difficulty in their life, there's hardship in their life. And that wish that they may be free from it, you know, that's a very kind wish in whatever way we can contribute to, to them being free from that problem, that difficulty. And the, the, these are part of the Brahma Viharas, so it's a whole set. And it's very interesting when the, the Buddha teaches it, often he's teaching them that we do all of them. We tend to do one or the other. <laughs> but he's teaching, you start with metta, then you do karuna, then you do mudita, and then you do upeka. You know? So this is uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy with others, success or good qualities, and then equanimity. And so he's teaching them as a set, really. But the wish for um, uh, the happiness of people, you know, that they may be happy, may I be happy, may they be happy, is metta. The wish that uh, somebody be free from suffering is usually taken as be compassion, 
you know, whether it be ourself or another. And the third one, mudita, is just taking joy, uh, being very happy at others' success or their good qualities. And this is the opposite of envy. So this is, I really think it's such a good thing to get into because it's like free happiness. Somebody's had good luck, <laughs> you know, well, it's probably not good luck, it may be hard work actually. <laughs> and then we can say, sadhu, 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 we feel good about it. But the usual reaction is, why not me? <laughs> oh, why don't I get that job? Why don't I get that promotion? Why don't I, you know, rather than turning it into a negative actually, we don't get anything out of that. But if we can um, have that feeling of joy for them, it's got that basic kindness and love there. And the same with equanimity, it's supported. It's not this indifferent, I don't care, <laughs> you know, about this other person, this situation. I don't care. That's not, that's not equanimity. Equanimity has got a love, lot of loving kindness in it. But it's also the realization, and this is very good for parents, that we, you know, we're all the owners of our karma. You know, whatever we, um, we have done or spoken or thought, we're the owners of that. And we, in many ways, we cannot, you know, you like to help people, but sometimes you can't help people because, yes, they're the owners of their karma. And we, the way we can help them is just supporting them with this equanimity, this loving kindness, this sense of balance. It's a balance for us, actually, because we don't get... Uh, you know, uh, burnt out. This is a thing that happens with people when they, uh, in helping professions, they often get burnt out because they feel like th they can't help as much as they wish, you know, and it's, it's too much. But we also realize that, you know, we each of us are the owners of our karma, so we're responsible, heirs of our karma, we're, we're responsible for our lives. And this is a very good thing for parents too, <laughs> they suffer with their children. They, they just know. Fortunately, from a Buddhist context, you know, they've got their karma. They bought it from a past life, too. I can do what I can do. But you probably, with parents, you realize there is a limit. But does that mean you don't love them anymore? No. Most parents will, you know, you, know, you don't say, you, you don't reject them because of that. But you just know the limits of it. You still support them, ideally, with this sort of loving kindness, this uh, metta. So that's the. The difference between uh, compassion, you know, as I understand it, and uh, metta, but it's a whole, you know, it's a whole package, as it were. The Buddha's teaching it as a whole package. <laughs> so they're all good qualities we need because we'll meet people in our lives that are in difficult times. We'll meet people who are having great success, and we'll be meet people who, there's just we can't do anything for them, but just have uh, this sort of loving support as much as possible, and understanding too that. They have their karma. That's that's why they are like they are at this moment. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, good. So any other questions, comments, complaints? Oh, Thanks. that's good. I just said I've always got something to ask or say. But um, oh, Bhante, Bhante, one of the things that I think does concern me, and mm. I do come across this, that people will say, oh, I can't help that person because that's their karma. Now, I'm not saying that you can necessarily help, but it's often a rather, it can be even quite a harsh kind of statement. I've heard this a few times. Mm. But surely, as you say, we do our best if we can help a little bit. If it's the right time, we do it. Yes. And if we can't help, we're at least kind and um, inclusive of them in our mm. uh, community. A and I do, f I do, having come into Buddhism sort of later in life, find that that karma thing can mm. be a bit of an excuse. Yeah, that's a very good. Thank you for that, Cora. That's true. And I think that's actually probably a misunderstanding of karma because... It almost has that sense of, well, it's their fate or their destiny that, that they be in this, you know, they've got this terminal cancer or they've just been run over by a bus or whatever it is. But that, of course, is not the Buddha's teaching at all. Karma is something we're making moment by moment and it's creating our futures moment by moment. So this is, uh, if people use it in that way, I think it's a misunderstanding of... Uh, in a way, it's often a way to protect ourselves, isn't it? If we say, well, what's their karma? <laughs> then we don't have to take any uh, um, responsibility. We don't, don't necessarily have to help. 
you know, we may be, sometimes that feeling can be that they can't feel like we can't help, you know, that they haven't got the, the wherewithal to help that person. But of course, you know, the Buddha's teaching is, is about these positive qualities, you know, and helping is one of them, if we can. It's a form of giving, and giving dana is the, you know, one of the foundations of the Buddhist path. Every aspect of the Buddhist path is giving, every aspect of it is leading to freedom. And uh, so this giving is, you know, taking care for people who are in difficult situations, realizing we can do what we can do, and that's it, you know. As I say, sometimes the limit is us, sometimes the limit is the other person. They don't want it. (laughs) They don't want that help. And uh, so that's a very good point. That's a misunderstanding of karma, of the sense of uh, destiny or fate, you know. They were fated to experience this, so, you know, then then they'll just have to experience it. And, you know, the Jain idea was that you, by by experiencing these things, you burn off that past karma. And uh, that's not a Buddhist idea. Because the idea that you have to exhaust or burn off all your negative karma in order to become enlightened, the Buddha said, you'll never become enlightened. <laughs> There's no end to it. But you can finish with it by becoming enlightened. So thank you for that, Gora. Good point. Yeah, yes, uh, what Cora said, uh, to do or, some, do or not do something for some other person mm. based on saying it's karma. Mm. That is, well, people do things to other people thinking mm. that the beneficiary is the person who is receiving it mm. without realizing that yeah. actually the best benefit is to, for the doer. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Very good. Sadhu. That's true. Yeah, that's, a, that's very, very true that when... You know, just that willingness to want to help to a person that's in difficulty. That's creating good karma, actually, immediately. The inten- having that intention and then acting on it is, is great good karma, you know. So this is, this is a very important um, understanding because all our positive, wholesome intentions, like what I'm talking about today, that will give rise to good karma. That will, that will be the outcome of that. And the negative ones, of course, they give rise to... Uh, um, unhol- uh, negative karma uh, ripening in the future. So the more we can do, that's good. Help others. Uh, the more we're helping ourselves. And also, you know, the uh, to a certain extent, when we do good, there's uh, instant karma. Often, not always, but often we feel, ah, oh, that was a good thing to do. I feel, you know, you feel good about yourself when you've you've done something good. You can really feel that. So that's a a uh, form of happiness that we can derive directly from giving, giving to others, giving to life. So thank you for that, Dr. Jai. And I think maybe now time to finish off. Cause the, and you're all welcome to expect It would be difficult for the people that are live streaming. You can't come to the dana, but we'll, we'll think of you. <laughs> and uh, so you're all welcome to come to the dana and uh, share, uh, have a shared meal together. All right.